I'm Sam Schwartz. I am an intern here at UW Oshkosh, and I've been doing some coding for Kim here, and I was just going to show a little bit of one of the things I've been working on here. Uh, sorry, I'm not doing all of them. Don't have time. Uh, I apologize ahead of time. This is currently not built to work in this low resolution, so it's going to look a little ugly. We'll work on that later. But anyway, so the workflow manager is a pretty popular add-on to deal with the workflows in Plone, and there are some concerns about the way the UI worked. So I've attempted to redesign it so that, oh wow, this really does look bad. All of it is in these lovely little flow charts that you can move around, edit, sorry. Everything is edited through pop-ups instead of going through the weird different I don't know what you would call it, blades, tabs of the old one. Um, all of this is done pretty much using Ajax, and it's pretty quick for me anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this is just being picky. Uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, I don't do a lot of public speaking, if you can't tell. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, all of it is just far, far more simplified than it was before. Uh, and hopefully, this will be the new face of the Plone Workflow Manager eventually. Although, like I said, much prettier than this. This is very much alpha right now. Uh, oh, yeah, I suppose to any of you who aren't familiar with the old Plone Workflow Manager. I apologize, this probably means absolutely nothing to you, but uh, any questions, any? Uh, what are you using to draw that? Or that is this is using uh, JS Plum. It's an open source JavaScript uh, framework to do this sort of stuff. It's pretty flexible, and I think everything we need to do should be great. Are you drawing that right on the canvas? Uh, excuse me? Are you drawing that right on the canvas? Or? Um, it's basically all of this is just <coughs> normal HTML elements just prettied up in a special way. So it's not really any kind of fancy drawing thing. That's just how JS Plum works, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> OK, so the uh, workflows in Plone, you know, different content items can be in different states, such as you know, the default one that comes on Plone is the, this workflow that starts out as private. And then you can you know, publish it to set it as published. You can have it set to you know, pending review. Uh, and of course, you can add extra transitions and extra states. And basically, what this tool is doing is it just, it's letting you look at the different ways that you can change content from one state to another, and you know the different actions that get attached to that. And I don't know, my work on it has just been making it a little easier on the eye and easier to understand. All right, well. What about snippets? <laughs> OK, fine. I'll put in a quick 30 you, seconds. You, you don't have enough time, so just come back at the end. <laughs> <laughs> fine, whatever. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm going to try to get my laptop hooked up here. And if it doesn't work, Christy's going to do it for me, so we're OK. Indeed, Christy, you want to just come up? <laughs> Oh. 
talk. I'll just show my computer. Okay. So um, I wanted to show uh, collective.jbot. It's, um, I don't know, how, how many of you fam are familiar with uh, JBot for customizing resources and templates? And you kind of just, it's, it's JBot stands for just a bunch of templates, and you put a bunch of templates in a folder, and it overrides <coughs> resources on your site. And it always had to be done in an add-on package, and so for, um, it wasn't really useful for maybe less technical people. So this is uh, collective.jbot is using that concept, but um, doing it through a, like where every site can have its own set of customizations and it's done through the web. And it can either be done at the site level or part of a, like a jbot folder in a, the IASO theme. And you just uh, search for templates, click the customize button, then we'll throw it in the folder and then you can click on that click on it now and then you can kind of customize it right there. Um, this is just the same uh, ace editor that Diazo uses. So it should be feel pretty comfortable with it and then that's it and it should be customized. You can um, right click on it, delete stuff. Yeah. Rename it. So yeah. Any questions? No, it's not portal view customizations. It's done differently, so you don't have to deal with permission issues and stuff. So if you're worried about um, this, could uh, if you're worried about your editors, you might not want to use it because they could write potentially unsafe Python with this. That's a uh, so portal view customizations. Sometimes if if you if you've tried to customize certain part, certain templates, you might run into uh, insufficient privilege errors, <coughs> and that's because once you customize them, then all of a sudden you're running that customization in restricted Python, and I, I, that's kind of a good and bad thing. Well, this goes around that, and so you have to trust your people who are customizing the site with this too. So. Yeah, there's going to be a cost. I haven't I haven't uh, calculated it, but yeah, there's going to be some cost and speed because it's got to run the customizations. Sure. Um, anything else? Yeah, we might, might sprint on it, at least uh, talk about how we can do um, some of these. Uh, we we want to be able to search the contents of the templates also, so people can just look at the markup of clone and then search a piece of, you know, maybe a, uh, a class name or an ID and then be able to pull it up right there instead of just finding the name of the template or a resource. Yeah, especially like this one, if you don't know the name of the global navigation bar, you, you know, you have to know that it's called sections.pt in order to customize it here. So it'd be nice if we were thinking maybe like a checkbox where you could say search contents of templates and then you could search for that specific ID that you need. Okay. Any other ideas would be welcome. Yep. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Chrissy. Yeah. <laughs>talking about 60 scale. So what is it? Uh, if you are familiar with Templar Zope Scale, it is you know, a way for you to write a command and quickly create a skeleton that you can use for your build out and content packages, things like that. Um, so this 60 scale is a specific one that we've created at six feet up uh, and it's customized to uh, work with our own processes. Uh, so I've updated it recently so it now creates what we call a unified build-out. Uh, you'll have questions with SoapScale, and I'm going to show this off in a minute. Um, you know, ask you if you want to create a content package, a theme package, or a policy package. And then it's going to put them all in the build-out for you. So you don't have to run separate commands for each one. It can all be done with a single command. Um, then what it does is it puts them all um, in the same, same area. You can uh, commit them all to the same repository. This is good because it allows for atomic commits, uh, removes the need of a disk repository, like um, when we do releases um, without a unified build out, you know, we're having to create a new, uh, a new egg of the content policy and theme. Uh, this removes the need for that, and so that re makes releases faster. 
I had something else I was going to say, and I can't remember right now. The code for this is up on GitHub. You know, if you are interested in going, going checking it out, or even forking it, adjusting it to work with your own processes, you know, go for it. So I'm going to show a demo of how this works. I'm um, working in a virtual env that already has 60 scale in, uh, installed. We do have this up. We have, we have a public disk. It's a disk.sixfeetup.com slash public. Uh, and it's available on there to, to grab. <coughs> so then all I have to do is run the templar command, um, saying it's a six feet up build out. And um, this one I'm just calling the folder symposium2. Uh, it's going to ask me, you know, you want easy mode, expert mode, I'll say easy for now. And give it a site name, I'll take that default of plone. The, the project name, uh, this is what your, the, the content package and uh, the policy and theme are all going to be named. Uh, they're all going to be the same thing. Latest plone version, then I'm going to take a bunch of defaults here. Uh, now here it's asking me if I want to use, uh, create a unified build out or not, I'm going to say yes. And it's going to ask me a question, you know, do I want to create a content package? You know, because sometimes we may create a, a build out that only has the policy and the theme. So we may not necessarily need all of these. So it's going to ask for each one. And then it's creating all of that for me. And it looks like it's complaining at me. But I, I had created one earlier so I could show it off really quick. Um, but at this point, once that's created, all you have to do is um, run, run bootstrap run build out, and start up the site. And so this is a site that I have here. I haven't touched the site yet. All I did was start the instance and log in over here. You can see, you know, up here it's telling me to replace this theme with your template. So I can see the theme is installed. It's even already activated. And, um, you know, once I'd set this all up, the whole process, you know, if build out runs quickly, the whole process took about five minutes. I can look under add-ons and see, you know, here's my symposium theme content and policy already installed for me. You don't have to take care of that part. And like I said, you can look at the theming control panel and see that there's my symposium theme already active and uh, ready to start developing. And I have one last slide, CrepCon tonight, 8.30, Verizon Village. It'll be awesome. Okay, any questions on 60 scale? Okay, thank you. Next. This thing only has PGA, just that. Okay. I'm messing with the program here. <laughs> okay. No, no. I mean, no. But what we could do too is we could take this demo it on. Oh, is it? Okay. Oh, okay. Ready. Uh, All righty. Now that the uh, technical difficulties are resolved, I'm uh, Tim Simpkins from the College of Ag at Penn State. And if anybody was in Chris's talk this morning, uh, he alluded to the fact that we were sued by the National Federation for the Blind. So accessibility is one of our, our main drivers in everything we do. Uh, 
historically in the College of Ag, we had had these things called publications, which were usually one or two page fact sheets, maybe a little bit more uh, that they would take and distribute on paper. So uh, a lot of folks are very, um, very tied to those, but we want to present those as web content. And in order to prevent uh, having two copies, having the web copy and the PDF copy that may have been created through InDesign uh, in as many cases as possible, I used a product called Report Lab, and it's Python-based that's a, a PDF generator. And what this does is it takes, it takes, if I can find my mouse, uh, it takes the, and I, I wrote some glue code that takes the plone HTML content, including the images from this fact sheet on skunks, and it runs it through that a, into a template that I created in Report Lab that emulates that fact sheet view. So it comes up with, we have a download PDF link in with our, oh, you know what? It would really help if I put, uh, no. Hey, there we go. <laughs> okay, so um, I, don't think, I don't think you missed too much by not seeing the uh, cute little picture of the skunk, but we have this uh, fact sheet on skunks that has been converted to web content, and in with our uh, social media icons, we have a download PDF icon. There we go. Uh, where we can download this PDF version of the web page and that comes out as a, uh, and it's, there was no manual labor involved in creating this, although you may need to switch the content around. And it just it comes out as a PDF fact sheet that they can print out and uh, hand out to whoever they're uh, giving a presentation on. So the package is called Report Lab. The code is really, really ugly, so I'm not gonna show it to you. But if, if you have a need for this where you don't wanna duplicate PDF and web content, it's at least something to look into. And it, it does work at a very low level. So, uh, so it's not something where you can say, here, take all my HTML and make a PDF out of it. It essentially iterates paragraph by paragraph. It says, oh, it's a uh, unordered list. Let's add you know, seven item list. Let's add seven list items to the PDF. But if it's, it is something that, that we uh, do find useful. So, any questions? Oh, yes. Can I, can I use it? I want to use it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, not a, it's not a product, but if it's something that, uh, or the, the PDF generation part, but that would be something, if there's interest in it, I think it would be worth developing as export from Plone as PDF. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, math and templating in setting up that, uh, that initial header footer so that uh, the Penn State extension at the top, you know, that you have to have your own logo and do, do a lot of customization to that, which is why I didn't start out to write it as a, as a standalone product. Yes? Is it also made, it'll make PDFs accessible? No. Uh, the PDFs, it actually doesn't, not to digress, but making PDFs accessible is really, really difficult. Yeah. Uh, Okay, good, glad, glad we're not the only ones. But in talking with the folks who are in charge of accessibility, uh, their standard is if there is an accessible copy of it, that being the web, uh, the web copy of it, so that's gonna be accessible because it has all the headers and everything, uh, then it doesn't matter if the PDF's accessible or not because, because there's the primary version is accessible. Uh, I don't know if that's, if that's the same standard to you, how you guys use. Oh, okay. Yeah, and our our general tactic is if it's if you have to have it as a PDF, good luck with that because it's uh, it really should be it should be web. Already, uh, any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. 
hope. Yeah. Yes, that's enough for talking. Okay, um, I want to introduce you to some tools that are already available. Some of them are even built into Plown, but that many people don't know, and they have to do with content quality. Because after your end users, um, the main people you should be concerned about are your editors. They are the people that keep your website interesting and fun for people to look at. So you should make life easier for them. Um, there are several ways to do that, and there are some add-on products that can do that. Uh, first of all is how many of you have ever switched the spell checker from uh, the default one that comes to plan to the one called after the deadline? One person only. That is a shame. There is actually, in current plan built in, you can switch the, uh, <coughs> the editor from uh, the uh, built-in one to uh, a service called After the Deadline. It's an open source product, and it does much more than spell check. It also uh, checks for things like grammatical errors, difficult um, sentences. Um, it has lots of, even on the normal plan, Starting page, if you click edit, and now I spell check, it tells me that R logged is a passive voice, it tells me that currently using is a redundant expression, uh, it color codes things with different color underlines. You can set it in the settings to be more or less anal about things. But it really helps. It's only available in Spanish, Portuguese, French, and English. But if your site uses one of those languages, I guess yours will mostly be using English, it is already <coughs> an invaluable help. Um, please, if you do it and you have a heavy site, also run your own instance of the After the Deadline software because they provide it as a free service, but it does get overrun. If, Everybody starts using it. It's really easy to set up on your server. Ask your local trusted sysadmin to do that for you. It's very, <coughs> very, it's very nice. It really helps. One other thing that really helps, um, that's an extra product that you have to fill in. Um, before we are getting to Plon 5, you can already install something called eea.tags. And that makes tagging actually workable for normal humans. Um, because now, if you start typing, well, this is an empty site, so tag not found. But normally, it will find all the tags so that people um, can pick the current tags. It's like the widget that we're going to have in Plone 5 looks more or less exactly like this. Uh, but you can have it now already. It's really nice. <coughs> Some other things that um, are actually amazing that not more people uh, install it. There is a product called collective.jekyll from Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. What that does is, do is several content quality checks um, on a lot of issues. Um, let's go to the home page. My home page is thankfully OK. I have installed this product. And you see here a little OK button. Um, I can click on it. And it says, I hope it's readable. Yes, I have uh, an OK short name format. I have a title. I have a summary. I have body text. And there are some spaces in my body text. Um, it even has more. Let's see if I can bring it up. Yeah. Um, I made a, an exact copy of the front page. And here it gives me a big red warning because my short name starts with copy of. And I'm sure all of your sites have leftover things with a short name URL of copy of. So this is a really nice way for your editors to be notified like, ooh, this is not good. Um, there are other ways that you can make the life uh, a lot easier of your editors. That is, for instance, if you're using images. I have an image here. Uh, the image also has warning because the title does not begin with an uppercase letter. It has no summary. Um, lots of things wrong with it. But it's a lovely image. 
Um, but I have, uh, <laughs> uh, I have also installed a little extra product called Image Editor. And that will allow you to do basic images, image editing right in your Plone site. Um, that way, casual editors don't have to learn how to use Photoshop or any kind of other uh, photo editing software. This is very lightweight editing, but for most people, it is kind of enough. There are other products out there that um, are a bit more fancy. But yeah, it's, it's a better option to have this in your plan site than to say people like learn an entirely new software. You have 30 seconds. I have 30 seconds. OK, I had some more, but I will skip those. Um, we have actually documented the, uh, these tools now. They are almost forgotten. They can now be found on docs.plone.org. If you have more suggestions on how to make the life of your content editors uh, easier, report them to docsplone.org. Uh, but do start using these. Your site quality will improve. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hector Velarde. I, I just want to talk about uh, a project that has been running in Brazil for like eight, nine years, I think. It was started uh, at Interlegis by Jan Ferry and other people. And it's about creating like um, distribution for uh, the municipalities of Brazil. It was based uh, on, on the first time, it was based, uh, I think, on Plon 2.1 or something like that. It was created like eight years ago, this one. So basically, they provide a virtual machine or a universal installer that will install uh, a Plon distribution with uh, some uh, other add-ons already. And it creates also a basic structure of the site. And they give they give this uh, for free for these municipalities that uh, are very small cities that they don't have probably nobody that can take care of this. And they just have to, ah, they also have to uh, teach how to, to use Plon, and then, then they can start using this, this kind of stuff. So based on this, uh, they have right now, I think, uh, like 800 municipalities using this. Uh, some of them are have better uh, designs because they have more resources, whatever. So based, based on this, uh, I think last year, uh, we are Simples Consultoria, we're uh, working on, on a project to create a, a similar approach for, for the federal government in Brazil. And that uh, became a really successful project that was installed on the main sites of the government. Right now, it's a, it's a requirement of the Brazilian government to install their sites with uh, using this uh, that it's called uh, identidad uh, how is it called I, I don't remember like a, a digital identity of the federal government something like that oh, so the this is one of the sites the president the site of the residency another one that it's the same thing we have created also some other add-ons for this like a, a specific agenda for the president and whatever. The code of this, uh, ah, also, uh, the interlegis, the, the other project that I told you, they just, uh, they are about to release a new version uh, using Plon 4.3. And also they have developed uh, some other uh, nice stuff like uh, some add-ons for transparency, some add-ons for, for no other stuff. I, I think I, I don't have too much time to talk about this. Both the code of, of, of both uh, projects is on, on GitHub. Here, here on Interledger, you will find the stuff for the, for the municipal cameras. And here uh, on Plonigop VR, you can find the, the other project for the federal government. And that's it. Um, questions? 
Uh, we, we are interested also in, in knowing if there are some other people uh, trying to, to make distributions of Plon. I, I know in the past we all, we all remember probably Plon for Artists. Uh, we don't remember it, it for, the, for the right things, but, but anyway. Uh, because we, we would like to see this kind of stuff probably coming out, uh, some distributions oriented for different uh, markets, we don't know. So, no questions? Yes? So are you saying that the president of Brazil uses plan? Yes. <laughs> Just check. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing on my screen yet, so. I'm not on the navigate, but I don't see it on my screen. Can you, can you use, in fact, I could just use here, I just want to demonstrate my website. I can just use your app, your, your terminal. What do you see? Yeah. What do you want to? I mean, I could just go to my website, basically. You use that. It doesn't matter. You can use the other one. Yeah. So you just want to yeah. Just, I'll do it just Just the website. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, can you can you fix that? Too? <laughs> just, I probably should have signed up for the lightning talk. I just decided off, right off the bat. Somebody encouraged me. I think it was William that encouraged me. So I really want to talk a bit about enabling a community to work together collaboratively using Plum. And I, I I retired from IBM about six years ago, and I want to be enable that my community, which is Rochester, Minnesota, to be more collaborative. For those of you that uh, from this area, you might have heard of the Mayo Clinic, which is a, one of the most renowned health institutions in the United States and probably in the world. So Mayo Clinic has embarked upon a thing they call Destination Medical Center, in which the next 20 years, Mayo Clinic is going to invest $3 billion to expand Mayo Clinic's presence in the healthcare industry. And they also have enabled, they've gotten private partners to donate $3 billion on top of it. So total investment about $6 billion to ensure that Mayo Clinic stays with Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins, et cetera, to, to, to maintain this position as a pre, uh, pre, preeminent healthcare provider. So now that we have this vision, and also Mayo Clinic says we need the city of Rochester, Normanstead County, to also, as a community, also expand. So that when visitors come, you will have total experience in the healthcare delivered. 
So, so that's a backdrop. So the state of Minnesota is investing like $500 million to build out this whole, whole building of this community. So now where, the, where did I come in? Well, I came in because there's a general recognition that as a community expands economically, it also causes stresses in the community services, such as population growth. And if you have more population, you have, well, what about people that are not physicians? They are simply in the, maybe the way in the restaurant service industry. So their wages are not in the six figure potentially. So there's social problems that community will face, such as affordable housing, such as transportation. But none of, the, none of these issues are being talked about necessarily by the, peop, by the destination medical center people. They're more about economic development. So that's the backdrop. So now, for those of us in the nonprofit world, you have the United Way, you have Rochester Area Foundation, you have University of Minnesota, Rochester campus, you have the Y, you have various social groups. They recognize that the emphasis the, the radar is on the economic engine, but nobody's paying attention to the social problems the economic engine might bring upon. So I'm saying, so now I say, let, we need to be more collaborative. United Way, Area Foundation, various social groups need to be collaborative to look at the problems social economic development might bring. So, so that's the backdrop. Now, historically, and I've known uh, most of these organizations are not collaborative. Okay, in fact, uh, Minnesota is known as a land of ten thousand lakes, but it can also be known as land of ten thousand organizations that do not work together. Okay, I, I know we actually watch this unique this way. So the challenge is to get them collab be collaborative. So we need to transform the, the, the conscience of the organizations so they be less fearful of each other. So what I, what I come in, I, want, I basically build a portal using Plone. Now, to, to the whole idea is to say, when you come to this portal, you see the social problems the community faces and who are the groups in the, uh, potentially consciously or unconsciously working to solve these issues. So you see that. And then what are the work products that they're, they're delivering? So right now is a one person shop. I actually was gonna demonstrate this, but I having a problem demo demoing. You have one. Okay, all right. So hopefully I can you know, demo later. I can give you URL, you can see it. So the whole, uh, what I wanna bring is maybe two, two things. One is that in order to, for the, for the benefit of the Plone community, we need to have a kind of visible solution to solve a real problem. So that people will say, okay, you have a portal. You mean one person had done all this all by yourself? Yes, okay. In other words, Plone can actually do it for you. I'm not kidding, I'm just one man, okay. I run the whole stack. I have to, you know, so I'm able to technically do it, number one. That's from a, also from a Plone community side, I believe that in order for Plone to really get buy-in, you need to get impact in the consumer. Make sure that users can find value. In other words, if you can persuade a destination medical center that's investing $6 billion, then you can say, boy, there's this solution here that enables a social structure to also develop with the economic structure. Now the conversation becomes more interesting. So two things that I was hoping that I can convey to you, as well as the portal itself. But, uh, but that's basically you know, what I wanted, the message. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah.